I'm really uh, happy to have Saurabh Amari uh, as a guest on the podcast. Uh, Saurabh is the uh, op-ed editor of the New York Post, uh, but he's not um, an ordinary journalist. He's also a real thinker, and Saurabh has published an important book, um, um, The Unbroken Thread, Discovering the Wisdom of Tradition in an Age of Chaos, a book that is uh, a bestseller, uh, but it's also a book that is full of meaty content. Sorab, thanks for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, let me ask you this. Your family uh, emigrated to America from Iran, and it seems that that experience through your family has is part of what inspired you to think in a different way about the meaning of freedom. Say a word about how your family's experience has uh, affected you and maybe what that had to do with you framing your book in this way. Yeah, sure. So um, I came from a, um, I was born into a very uh, secular liberal family in post-revolutionary Iran. And what that meant was that uh, a lot of our life was defined in opposition to the Islamic Republic, which is a brutal uh, theocracy. And um, for a lot of Iranians of my and my parents' milieu, what that led to is a belief that, well, if tradition is the Islamic Republic, then all tradition is bad, basically. And we thought of the United States as a society that um, is ultra-individualistic, rational, quote-unquote, meaning unhindered by the superstition of religion in the past. And that was the worldview that I adopted for much of my teenage uh, years and into my 20s. But then, you know, uh, as I grew a little bit older, I began to um, question that and question that account of freedom, whether that was um, sufficient for a really good society and especially became acute when I became a father. Um, well, first of all, when I became a Christian and then when I became a father, um, where I worry that the account of freedom that prevails in contemporary America that says freedom just means, you know, having the maximal amount of choice and getting ahead in life and uh, generally just pleasing yourself in various ways is a sufficient account of freedom in terms of what I pass on to my son, Max. Saurabh, so, you mentioned uh, becoming a Christian. And um, um, what was the single most important thought or experience that caused you to do that? I mean, as you say, when you came to America, it's almost like you had identified with this sort of notion of choice, uh, uh, of freedom, uh, of, of doing what you will as in opposition to the kind of theocratic approach uh, of Iran. Uh, what made you say, wait a minute, um, the, the Christian tradition, the Christian beliefs, that's something I want to embrace? So the, the biggest stumbling block for me was just coming to believe in a personal God. Uh, because I had declared myself an atheist while living under the Ayatollahs, because, again, I associated God with judicial amputations and, and floggings and so forth. Um, so then I thought all religion is this kind of backwardness. But once I came to believe in a personal God, and the way I did that, I guess I, I could say God's action is his grace, but my response to it was through reasoning, and that reasoning came via the conscience, the fact that I had this interior voice uh, that tell, pointed me to, to try to do good and to avoid evil, which then suggested that there is some objective moral order into the world and human beings are inherently called to bring themselves into adherence with that order. Um, I thought and I thought and I, you know, I read Pope Benedict's books, I read the Bible, um, it's kind of there, there was an intellectual formation there and ultimately came to conclude that that interior voice of the conscience and that evidence for an objective moral order points to the existence of a personal God. From there to, to accepting a God of the Bible was much easier. And so that, that was a real uh, definitive moment. You know, Saurabh, I was just reading a, um, a few lines from Paul's letter to the Romans, and something struck me that I hadn't quite seen in there before, which is that Paul says basically that the knowledge of God through conscience and through the world 
is sort of impressed on every human soul. Paul implies, in other words, that there's no such thing as genuine atheism, that even the atheist deep down knows that there is a God. Now, he might be an open uh, rebellion against God and might be recruiting his rational f- faculties to make the case against God, but I guess Paul's point is that the faculties are being employed as, as, as troops, as armored divisions to justify something that he already believes. Um, do you think that's true? I mean, of course I do, because I, I believe that uh, Paul was an inspired author, but I, you're, you're referring to Romans chapter 1, and that's a critical line, I think, for uh, the field of natural theology. That is, what you can know about God without the benefit of revelation. What Paul, St. Paul is saying there is you can, even the pagans, which he's referring to, um, had a responsibility to or did, in fact, recognize God, because how else would they explain the orderly nature around them? Um, so, obviously, Aristotle uh, achieved precisely what uh, St. Paul talks about in chapter 1 by ultimately uh, concluding that there must be some un- uncaused cause behind all of the orderly changes that we observe around us. I think one of the fascinating things, Saurabh, about your book uh, is that uh, your defense of tradition isn't just a defense of sort of one particular tradition, but it seems that in a, in a kind of uh, synthetic, or maybe I could say Catholic, using the small c sense of the term, you draw on Judaism, you draw on Confucianism, you seem to, in a sense, appropriate from the world's traditions uh, a, a, a sort of a, a set of shared principles that you think can form the moral anchor of a healthy society. Talk for a moment about why you decided to do that. Right. So as a Christian, I obviously adhere to capital T tradition, which is a very specific source of authority, the church fathers and so forth. Um, but I, obviously, precisely because of the, the bit you read in, in St. Paul, um, very uh, many other civilizations have been uh, granted through their natural reason, lo- lots of access to the natural law, to ethics, to how to order a political society properly, even if they don't have the benefit of Judeo-Christian revelation. And so um, I'm, I'm very clear about my commitments that ultimately I, I'm, I'm a Christian, but um, you know, someone who thinks that natural reason is a powerful force in the world can also draw on Confucianism. The Confucian teaching about filiality, for example, of respect for your mother and father, um, of course, not just with natural law, but it then is mirrored in the divine law in the Mosaic commandment to honor your mother and father. So I do keep open that there are certain tensions between the traditions I draw on. So Seneca, I bring in, you know, he was way too comfortable for suicide, with suicide, and I disagree with him there. But, and St. Augustine, who is also a character in the book, absolutely and then spends the first few chapters of the City of God inveighing against suicide. But there is, as you said, this kind of ecumenical, I hate the word, but there's no better word, this kind of ecumenical wisdom sp- sprinkled among the nations um, that uh, a person can uh, cohere together in a, in a kind of traditionalist project. Like when we come back, I'm going to ask Sora Bamari about his young son and why he fears that the sort of world's definition or America's definition of success is not uh, what he wants for his son. We'll be right back.